There is a fundamental and important work by Einstein and Rosen, thanks to which the concept of the world as two identical sheets of space connected by short junction tubes appeared for the first time in theoretical physics history. Such connections between areas of space were called Einstein-Rosen bridges. Nowadays, they're most often referred to as wormholes. And in sci-fi, this is a favorite way for fast travel between far-spaced points of the universe. However, the paper by Einstein and Rosen was devoted not to wormholes for spaceships at all, but to a new description of the nature of matter and elementary particles. They were the first, but not the only ones who hypothesized that our world could be dual. Another genius physicist, Paul Dirac, developed this idea in his original theory of the existence of a hypothetical world. This idea, of course, has a lot of historical references such as Giordano Bruno's theory of the coincidence of contraries, as well as the belief held by certain schools of Indian philosophy that the universe has two separate realities and countless other philosophical concepts that describe opposite but interconnected forces. The famous Dirac equation describing the behavior of an electron in an external force field is rightfully considered not only the most amazing magic of this great theorist, but also one of the most significant equations in physics, and as it turned out later, a fundamentally important equation for mathematics. When it provided a complete explanation of hydrogen's atomic emission spectrum, this equation was very quickly accepted by the physical community as the fundamental equation for the electron. But as it turned out, the most exciting thing was that this same equation contains much, much more than what Dirac was initially looking for. The most outstanding feature of the Dirac equation was its extremely unusual fourfold mathematical structure, which allows it to predict highly unexpected and strange things. At first, this seemed to be a big problem. But soon enough, a positron predicted by its math as an electron antiparticle was actually discovered in cosmic radiation. This became a true triumph for Dirac and his equation. But there was still a problem after all this grand success, though. According to the Dirac equation, for every solution with positive energy in nature, for example an electron, there is a counterpartner with negative energy, which is interpreted as antimatter. In real life, though, we clearly observe only one half in a stable form, our particles of matter, while the particles of the second half, antimatter, instantly annihilate. That is, they are mutually destroyed upon contact with the matter of our world. How is it possible, then, that in conditions of annihilation, only one of the halves always remains? Could it be because we are asking the wrong question? As the Dirac equation shows, the world of nature indeed consists of two symmetrical halves, but the other half of the world is no less stable than ours, because it is not antimatter at all. If we imagine the geometry of space as a one-sided surface, then both halves of the world are actually the same universe. It was a kind of a theory that Dirac developed by the spring of 1941, and in June, despite the war that was already raging in Europe, a great chance came up to present it publicly to colleagues from the scientific community. That year, Dirac was invited to give a Bakerian lecture, which was very honorable among British academics. He proposed an original and beautiful solution, but it raises big questions about the interconnection of such things with the generally accepted concepts in the science of physical reality. In the Dirac model, the probabilities could well be negative, along with negative energies for particles. He explained to the audience that negative energies and probabilities should not be rejected as meaningless nonsense at all. Dirac reminded that in mathematics, such concepts have actually been well developed for a long time, since they are very useful in calculations. For example, everyone who has a basic understanding of finance can well imagine a negative amount of money which, in reality, no one has ever seen. Similar to this, physical equations expressing important properties of energies and probabilities can still be used in cases where they operate with quantities with negative values. 
In other words, negative probabilities and energies should be considered simply as things that exist somewhere else but do not appear in the experimental results of the actual world. It's clear that a next question arises. If negative energies and probabilities are not observed in the actual world, then where can they exist? As an answer, Dirac put forward his idea of a so-called hypothetical world. That is, another world that complements ours and which contains all those states of negative energy that are necessary for the theory and that are not observed in the actual world. According to his colleagues, the new concept of the hypothetical world looked physically feasible, but highly unusual and even mystical. The mysterious magic of the mathematical part was impressive, though. Wolfgang Pauli, famous in these circles for his strict criticism and very harsh assessments, took Dirac's Bakerian lecture with uncharacteristic enthusiasm and even wrote a special letter to him with warm words of approval and support. The initial enthusiasm quickly faded away, though. Either the time was not right or for some other reason. But this idea did not receive support from any of the other prominent theorists. Moreover, today there are quite distinct attempts to pretend that Dirac had no such theory about a hypothetical coexisting world at all. During the first post-war years, thanks to the efforts of young theorists, a new quantum electrodynamics was born. The updated theory saved particle physics from serious problems with infinites and divergences in the equations and began to give extremely accurate predictions at the output, strikingly coinciding with the data of experimental results. This was the first block that was laid in the foundation of the standard particle model. But it didn't work for Paul Dirac, and he did not accept the new theory. He disliked a lot of things about it, and in his opinion, the idea of a naked electron as a point was profoundly incorrect. That is, the concept of an elementary electric charge considered in isolation from the electromagnetic field. In order to get rid of such an erroneous entity and find the root cause of failures, Dirac decided to return to the origins of the classics, to Maxwell's equations of electromagnetism, and to the conceptual foundations on which they were created. And it should be remembered that these foundations had the concept of ether as an all-pervading thin matter, the concept of the field as a tense state of ether, and the concept of electric charge as a local oscillating excitation of the field. As a first thing, Dirac decided to deduce a new classical theory of the electron in such a way that in the equations the electric charge of the electron does not appear as a separate entity at all. Technically, this task turned out to be solved, he emphasized that his new theory is no longer a theory of point charges, but operates with continuous flows of electrical energy. In fact, according to Dirac's interpretation, the most remarkable feature of this new quantum theory of electromagnetism turned out to be the concept of a universal all-pervading ether that was returning to modern physics. But in the early 50s, when he put forward these new ideas, any talk about the long-rejected theory of the ether was considered as a backward idea. After all, the modern science community knew perfectly well that the victory of Einstein's special theory of relativity finally and irrevocably canceled the ether, so that since the 20s this concept was actually withdrawn from physics. At the same time, almost no one wanted to admit the fact that Einstein's general theory of relativity, which appeared a dozen years after the special one, quite clearly declared excessive haste with the cancellation of the ether. For example, the so-called empty vacuum space itself has specific physical characteristics such as geometric shape and energy. In other words, it cannot be understood as empty at all, and Albert Einstein himself back in 1919 was the first to talk about the return of ether to physics. Dirac published a whole series of works where he provided a detailed conceptual and mathematical justification for the fact that the attraction of ether is very useful for the new physics, and that as a very light and thin form of matter, it can exist in quantum mechanics in complete harmony with the relativity principles. 
Moreover, if we accept the idea of the ether not as a dedicated fixed frame of reference that was rejected in the special theory of relativity, but as another form of matter with the corresponding dynamics and particle velocity distribution, then other previously rejected things naturally return to physics. In particular, the ideas of absolute time and absolute simultaneity of events. Four years later, Nobel laureate Wolfgang Pauli made his major discovery, and there are very good reasons to believe that it would not only beautifully complement Dirac's natural philosophy theory, but also give it exactly what it was lacking previously – new physical ideas. The key essence of these ideas can be distilled down to a single Pauli's phrase, quote, division and reduction of symmetry. This, then, the kernel of the brute. The second part of the phrase, originally written in German to Heisenberg, is taken from a scene in Faust, during which a black poodle follows Faust home and transforms into a wandering scholar, who is actually Mephistopheles, the devil in disguise. Faust then realizes that the hidden was in the obvious. Pauli explained this further, pointing to the fact that the original meaning of the German word doubt used in Goethe's tragic play meant once a division into two. In the follow-up letter a week later, Pauli was leaving another key to his discovery by referring to some kind of his own anti-symmetry. Quote, The picture keeps shifting all the time. Everything is in flux. Nothing for publication yet. But it's all bound to turn out magnificently. No one can tell what marvels will appear. Wish me luck. I am learning to walk. Enough for today. This is powerful stuff. The cat is out of the bag and has shown its claws. Division and symmetry reduction. I have gone out to meet it with my anti-symmetry. I gave it fair play, whereupon it made its quietus. Alas, this key was immediately lost, since only Werner Heisenberg knew about it, and he did not understand the mysterious meaning of these phrases himself. Moreover, he did not tell others about them for a long time. For an adequate perception of Pauli's ideas, it is necessary to remember that dreams played a huge role in his life. He paid close attention to them, always wrote them down, analyzed them, and then tried to project them into his physical and theoretical research. The impulse for the beginning of the study we are interested in, which ended with a grand discovery, was one of Pauli's dreams, in which he saw twins, a boy and a girl, similar to each other to such an extent that he got the feeling that shortly before they were one person. And this was not the first hint to focus on the idea of doubling. In another consonant dream, an Asian woman performed a kind of a dance on a spiral staircase connecting two parallel levels. By keeping moving up and down in a spiral, she managed to convey to Pauli by the language of dance that in fact there is no difference between top and bottom and that in reality, there is one level here, but forked. If we superimpose this dream on the theoretical construction known as the Einstein-Rosen bridge, it is easy to see that the model of a particle proposed by Einstein as a bridge between two coexisting worlds receives a significant addition. According to the explanations of the dancer from Pauli's dream, the connection is not just a static tunnel, but a more complex dynamic system that along with the rotation of the particle also provides its constant movements or harmonic vibrations from one surface to another. Starting from here, it's quite logical to move on to the mathematical constructions of Paul Dirac. For example, to the Dirac equation, which describes a Bispinger particle constantly jumping between two states and also to the fact that the mathematically convenient hypothetical world of Dirac in this context becomes the second half of the forked universe. Now, we should return to the fundamental work of Einstein and Rosen, who first presented the concept of the world as two identical sheets of space connected by interdimensional tunnels. Now, it should be noted that this work title was The Particle Problem in the General Theory of Relativity and it gave a substantially new description for the nature of elementary particles of matter. 
The novelty was in the idea that a particle is not a point, but a neck of a microscopic tube connecting our space with a second coexisting one. This tube is a kind of bridge that we can call a wormhole. But in the Einstein-Rosen paper, the wormhole had the property to be non-traversable. It is a very unstable passage and gets destroyed very fast. And so what can you do with a wormhole if you can't put anything through it? And it turns out that's because the authors didn't put it into quantum physics. Now, same year, another paper, commonly referred to as EPR by Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen, was published. It was about quantum entanglement, or what Einstein called a spooky action at a distance, something he was not happy with. Entanglement is a property of subatomic particles to act as a twin, even if you take them apart to the different edges of the universe. They hold information, and if you measure the one, you know what the other would be. Now, at that time, there was no reason to think about these two papers that they had anything to do with one another. Only in 2013, Maldacena and Suskind proposed that wormhole ER equals quantum entanglement EPR, and that they are obviously the same. That was totally unexpected. So the basic idea was that when you have a quantum entanglement between two particles, necessarily there would be a wormhole connecting them. People are fascinated about wormholes as an exotic configuration of space-time, and many were speculated if they could actually work. In 2019, Jafferis and Gao came up with a solution to this problem. One of the magical things of quantum mechanics is that you can have a negative energy, and this allows you to do the things that otherwise were impossible. The kind of things that Dirac previously envisioned with his hypothetical world idea. What was shown is that if you introduce a negative energy shockwave, you would support your wormhole and get something from one end to come out the other. November 2022, Santa Barbara, California. The team, led by Maria Spiripulo of the California Institute of Technology, implemented the novel wormhole teleportation protocol using Google's quantum computer, a device called Sycamore. The team set out to create a wormhole in the lab based on Daniel Jeffress' traversable wormhole protocol. They hope to design a quantum circuit that's mathematically equivalent to a wormhole. If successful, it would be the first experimental demonstration of a wormhole equals quantum entanglement. The experiment was successful. What happened was the qubits of the Google quantum computer were making a little bit of extra space, and that's our wormhole. A pulse of negative energy fell into the wormhole, and now it became traversable. It opened. They put a qubit from one side of the wormhole. Once the qubit is in the interior of it, that information actually spreads to the entire quantum system. This spread of quantum information becomes shared through many particles and forms the quantum entanglement, and then remarkably refocused into the single qubit. And then, as the wormhole is closing, the qubit is exiting. So now we have first experimental results for bridges that can connect our world with a hypothetical world. And these are traversable. And that besides indicating deep aspects of reality that science has not mastered yet. And as it always has been in physics, as our tools evolve, more powerful quantum computers might be able to look more deeply into highly entanglement matter. This line of thinking might even take us towards an explanation of where the universe came from. Latham Boyle has been working with Neil Turok, his colleague at the Perimeter Institute, on what they call a two-sheeted universe that involves a set of symmetries known as charge, parity, and time. In this hypothesis, the Big Bang is a kind of mirror separating our half of the universe from its mirror antimatter image on the other side of the Big Bang. This model suggests the existence of an anti-universe paired with ours, and where time runs backwards. The anti-universe will stretch back in time from the Big Bang, getting bigger and bigger, and it will be dominated by antimatter, or, as was predicted by Dirac, be the world saturated by positrons, and its spatial properties will be inverted compared to those in our half. The situation is similar to the creation of electron-positron interaction in a vacuum. 
Now, theoretically, in normal conditions, anti-humans from antimatter will never be able to be present in our reality, since when antimatter comes into contact with our matter, mutual annihilation occurs. But what if there was a way and technology that allows to travel in between? A technology that will be based on the fundamental nature of particles as wormholes bridges that connect and hold these two sheets of the same forked universe. So, the idea of Paul Dirac about a hidden but coexisting world might become not just hypothetical one day, and maybe lost keys to the big discovery of Wolfgang Pauli will be found again. <laughs>